which is uh, so we're uh, we've got uh, Dr. Holly Mansell, Nicola Rosasen, uh, Parag Trivedi, and Terry Steves Guernsey, who will talk about the development of an organ transplantation educational mini series for patients and what they have learned about patient engagement in that project. So uh, Dr. Mansell is uh, an associate professor in the College of Pharmacy and Nutrition uh, at the University of Saskatchewan. She's a pharmacist who specializes in transplantation, but these days most of her time is spent on research and teaching pharmacy students. Her research focuses mostly on transplantation patient education, patient-oriented research, and cannabis and youth. She is also working on a PhD in health sciences and her family is really looking forward to her finishing it up this summer. Uh, and then we have uh, second speaker is Nicola Rosazen, completed a pharmacy residency and was hired as a staff pharmacist at St. Paul's in Saskatoon in 1992. In 2002, she was offered a position uh, at the Saskatchewan Transplant Program. At Transplant, Nicola found a professional home a place of ongoing learning and research, but best of all, a place that encouraged the development of long-term relationships with so many wonderful patients. Parag Trivedi received a, a kidney transplant at the age of 15 from his father after a shocking diagnosis of kidney failure. Uh, once healed, he wanted to try and continue service to his community as best he could, and in 2012 was accepted in the University of Saskatchewan College of Pharmacy where he was fortunate enough to contribute to a patient education project uh, for patients in renal failure. And, uh, and the final speaker is, oh, sorry, is uh, Terry Steves Guernsey, uh, who received her Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from the University of Saskatchewan in 1994, 1974, and became a certified biology technologist from the Royal University Hospital in 1976. She received a kidney transplant in 2004 at St. Paul's Hospital and continued to work until 2018 when she retired from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Over to you, Holly, Nicola, Parag, and Terry. Thank you so much. Can everybody see the slides okay? Uh, yep. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, I just wanted to start off by saying we're so happy to be here. Um, Nicola and I have presented on this project before, but this is the first time we've had the privilege of co-presenting with our patient partners, Prog and Terry, and so we're just really excited for this. So uh, I also want to start off by saying that we are joining you here today from Treaty 6 territory and Treaty 4 territory in the homeland of the Métis. And so we pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place, and we reaffirm our relationships with one another. So today we're going to basically provide an overview of a quality improvement project that was aimed to improve transplant patient education. We're going to hopefully show how patient and family involvement shaped our process, and we're going to share what we learned about patient engagement. And so I'm going to start off by walking through kind of what we did, and I'll highlight where we involved patients on the slides in red. And so the project that we're talking today really stemmed from a need that we were seeing in clinical practice. And as mentioned in the bios, Nicola and I are both pharmacists, and we were doing a lot of medication discharge teaching for patients after they had received their kidney transplant and before they were going home from the hospital. And obviously this is a really stressful time and there's a lot of new information to learn. But nevertheless, we were pretty surprised at the amount of patients that were surprised that they had to take their anti-rejection -re medications for life. And I've included a couple of quotes here which highlight the problem. So the first one, do I have to take these medications forever? We used to hear this all the time. And the second, because I couldn't read worth a darn, I fully didn't understand. It was the pig to the poke. And so that is just tragic. And so something critical was being missed. And our transplant team did provide information before the transplant, both verbally and written, but clearly there was a gap between what we were providing as information and what patients were understanding or remembering. And so the first thing we did was we consulted with the patient and family advisory committee, and they indeed confirmed the need for more education. So we knew we needed to do something, but we weren't really sure what or how. 
and it seems sensible to perform a needs assessment by asking patients and healthcare providers what they think that patients needed to know. And so that's where we started. And so the needs assessment had four separate components and Nicola and myself led it. And we also enlisted the help of our other team members and we got some pharmacy summer students to help. And this is where we brought in Prague. You can see his name at the top here. And at the time when we started this process, he was a third year summer student and he had had a transplant. And he came up to me when, um, I think it was after class one day and said, you know, um, I had a transplant and I'm really interested in maybe doing some work with you. And I thought, oh, this is wonderful. You are perfect for this project. And you'll see that Prague is a grown up pharmacist now um, because this project took us a long time, but we're really happy that he's stuck with us the whole time. So we did a literature review, which was really sort of looking at the different kinds of literature which were published on this topic. We did an assessment of patients who were waiting for a kidney transplant to see what they knew about transplant medications. We also got input from patients who had pre previously received a transplant, so we wanted to know what they wish they would have known in hindsight. And we got input from healthcare providers. And we decided it would be useful to sort of formalize these pieces of information and share them with other transplant centers. And so we published them into three separate manuscripts. So the first one was what we call a descriptive study, and it helped us to learn about our pre-transplant patients and all of the patients were invited to participate. And we collected some information about where they live, their age and their language, and whether or not they had access to different sorts of technology like the internet. And we were surprised and, and happy that over 90% did actually. And so another thing we did is we asked them to share their thoughts freely. And one of the things we sort of realized as healthcare providers and researchers, Often when we decide a set of questions, we get the answer to the questions we ask, and we don't always ask the right questions. And so we had a lot of open-ended places for patients to, to share their thoughts freely and tell us how they felt. And we learned that patients indeed were, you know, um, needing some more information and they were not really satisfied with our process. And so the next thing we did was a focus group with patients who had received a transplant, again, to, to sort of learn what they wish they would have known in hindsight. And at this point, Nicola and I thought that our videos would really be about medications, but this group of patients really just taught us so much more. We learned that medications were just a small part of the problem and patients wanted to know about the testing. They couldn't understand all of the tests. They wanted to know about the wait list and the surgery and the recovery. And this is really where our project got blown up. And instead of becoming a project just about medications, it really became a project about the entire transplant process. So then we went on to sort of interview healthcare providers. And instead of Nicola and I doing these interviews, we thought it would be much better to have our patient partner, Prague, jump in and to sort of do these questions to help people feel more comfortable answering them likewise. And Prague conducted the interviews and he was instrumental in completing this part of the project. And you can see he's even first author on our paper here. And um, the surprising thing to us was that this study with healthcare providers really mirrored what we were seeing with patients. They needed more information about the whole process. And so why video? Well, um, this is something that we discussed a lot. And we thought, well, you know, it's a way to provide consistent information. You can use diagrams and illustrations to help patients with poor health literacy and make information easier. It doesn't really require any more healthcare provider time. You can add it into what you're already doing. And you can also play them at home. You can share them and replay them as much as you want with your support system. And you could include information from a variety of different sources, like actual patients and healthcare providers. And I think the other reason which really spoke volumes to us is that patients actually suggested they wanted videos. And so we ended up with a mini series, basically, which describes the transplant process, kidney transplant. So the first one is an introduction. The second one is about the kidney. The third is about the assessment and the wait list. The fourth is about the operation and the recovery. The fifth is about medications. And then the sixth is about those questions you might have after you have your transplant. And so based on patient feedback, we have this animated character who's embarking on a transplant journey. 
Um, we have a lot of illustrations and we have a lot of testimonials from patients and healthcare providers. And overall, over 35 patients volunteered to help and share their knowledge and experience with transplantation. I think I'll pass it to you, Nicola, if you can see this. Yeah, I think I think I turned on my, my uh, camera and my microphone. Can you hear me? I can. Perfect. Okay. And so our videos were made up of uh, a series of segments of animation and clips of real people, as Holly said. We didn't use any actors at all, and no one pretended to be someone that they weren't. Patients and healthcare providers are real and spoke for themselves with no script. We think that the videos are professional and believable, but really authentic as we used real voices and encouraged everyone to say what they thought was important. It was really exciting when the videos were completed. It was, as Holly said, a multi-year project. It, it took a, a lot of time. And once they were done, I for one just wanted to get them out there and let people use them in whichever way they found useful. But Holly wearing her research hat did remind me that as healthcare providers, we really need to remember that we are responsible to make sure that any kind of an intervention, whether it be a medication or an educational tool is actually effective before we release it out into the world. We again went back to our key patient collaborators um, for advice on how to test the videos. And it became clear quite quickly that we were going to need a research assistant. And we were thrilled to be able to engage one of our patients, uh, Terry Steves Guernsey, to act as our research assistant. She helped to design the process and connect patients and uh, connect with patients, sorry, to ask if they would like to participate. I think this piece was really huge. We found that patients responded well to Terry and we're certain this is because she approached patients with empathy, understanding, and sometimes the sharing of her own story and which helped to explain what participating in the study would be uh, you know, a benefit for patients like themselves. As far as the results are, are, are concerned, in a nutshell, we determined that knowledge and satisfaction were higher in the video group. We thought the information collected would be useful for other programs to know, so we did write up the results for publication. Our patient partners helped along with the writing process as well, and we were proud to submit this paper, including all of us, patients, practitioners, and experts as authors. We think that this type of authorship makes clear the value of true teamwork in the betterment of patient care. In Saskatchewan, we have implemented the video series into the assessment process. Patients receive a letter inviting them to view the videos immediately after they are referred for transplant assessment. The invitation letter includes both a video link and a QR code, and letters are sent via email or by regular mail, uh, depending on patient preference. So far, there have been 130 letters sent from our Saskatoon office, and there have been very positive comments from patients. Patients have been happy to receive the education. They felt they were uh, better understanding the process before they entered into it after watching the videos. They were happy the videos could be repeated and watched over and over again as many times as necessary and shared with family and friends. We've obviously had patients with a couple of issues with respect um, to technicalities. Um, one patient did have a language barrier and ended up having a family member watch and translate for her um, as she spoke only Mandarin. And one patient did have difficulty with a QR code, which she sorted out by calling her granddaughter. We will continue to collect data as we want to make sure that we aware, are aware of access issues and continue to work um, through them so all patients are able to view the videos should they wish. We learned a number of lessons, I think, about patient engagement throughout the life of this project. And the first thing I think is that authentic partnership is essential. We asked for patient input because we needed help and direction. Patient partnership was never a tick in the box for us. It was critical to our success. And when we say the word partnership, I think the word implies a give and take. And we truly hope that our patient collaborators felt some benefit from partic participation in the project, just as we benefited from their wisdom. Partnership also implies respect not just of patient opinions and input, but also of patient time. I mean, obviously when you're, you're dealing with a multi-year project like this, we, it's really important to respect patient time by making sure we're clear with what we're asking and also making 
clear that what we ask actually benefits the project and also comes with some sense of what kind of time commitment we're asking for. Our videos benefited from many, many patient stories, and it became abundantly clear that one person's lived experience can vary greatly from another's, and as such, many stories are needed to provide any sort of representative picture. Along with a great variety of patients, our team included clinicians working alongside researchers, and I think this allowed us a wider variety of ways to connect with patients. And lastly, we learned that our patients have a wide variety of skills that they're willing to share in addition to sharing their lived health experience. And with that, I think I'll uh, introduce our first patient uh, speaker, Mr. Parag Trivedi. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as, I, as the slide says, everything in life is about stewardship. So um Saskatchewan is a very you know small place and uh the healthcare system's a very tight-knit community um so as Holly had mentioned I crossed paths with her when I was in pharmacy school I had crossed paths with Nicola she was my pharmacist when I went through all of this uh some time ago as a patient and um so why why did I get involved it's 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 that stewardship piece that uh what I went through in my life is, uh, and what any transplant patient or their family will go through, it's a very significant thing. So for me to be able to give back in some way um, was, was, it was just natural because that stewardship piece I keep mentioning is, is that if you can find something and you can at least leave it better for the next person, then you're doing a really good thing. And uh, you know, Having gone through what I went through, um, my feelings on participation were were pretty uh, uh, pretty clear. That like I spent over a hundred days in the hospital. Um, I was very young when all of this happened to me, so it was it was in a way very cathartic for me to uh, to give back. Um, having in what I kind of looked at taken uh, so much from, and so you, when you're sitting in that hospital bed, you kind of learn, well, this really worked really well. I learned really well from this. And you kind of also see that, well, this could have been a little bit better. I wish I had known more about this um, going on. So in some way, it was uh, a little bit therapeutic. So we'll hop over to the uh, next slide here and um, kind of talk about what the project got out of it. Um, we've mentioned quite a bit about this partnership concept and this model, uh, the way I always look at it is, is if you make something for an audience, you might do well, but unless you know what your audience is seeing and what your audience wants, you're not going to ever get the full picture. So I was very fortunate that as a young transplant patient, and then kind of crossing into becoming a healthcare provider, I could kind of see just about any angle of this. And from my patient side, especially, I thought it was really important that, you know, being able to kind of provide that, um, that sense of information to your, your fellow transplant patient would be huge. Um, what did I get out of it? Well, I was a pharmacy student and I got credit hours out of it. I got my name on a paper before I graduated um, and I got to do a lot of cool things. So I remember walking around the very same hospital that I'd been hospitalized in a lot of the time on the same ward, even in the same rooms that I had been a patient in with the camera on the tripod over, uh, tripod over my shoulders with all the camera gear and recording stuff, plonking it down, setting it up and having honest conversations with patients, their families and their providers. Um, which I mean, like how cool is that? Uh, so you see there, there's a picture. There was one day where I remember Holly came to my office and says, what are you doing at three o'clock this morning? And I, I was like, it's the middle of the summer. It's like a midweek day. I'm probably going to be sleeping, nothing much. How about meeting a plane with a donor organ coming in uh, from the West Coast? And I was like, yeah, sure. So uh, it's something you only kind of see in like movies or TV, but I got to meet the plane. I got to film parts of the surgery. I got to scrub in and all of that. So that's, that's just a really, uh, a really neat thing. And, and the last thing I'll kind of answer about what I got out of this as a patient was is that uh it is like i said it's a significant health event and um 
being a transplant patient is, is uh, something that you can either let define you or you can define that transplant patient spot. And I am the kind of person that I don't want to be defined by what experience I have lived through, but I can use that to define what I can do with the rest of my life. So I had my second shot at life when I was like 16. Uh, and I'm here, thankfully, I've been able to do a lot with my, with my gift of life and I wanted to pay it forward. With that, I'm gonna pass it off to Terry. Um, Terry had just retired from her job at the uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And she had mentioned to Nicola that she was looking forward to having more time to get involved with other projects. Serendipitously, uh, the team was looking for research assistant at that time. Terry had completed the Tri-Council Research Training Modules and helped enroll patients with the uh, follow-up in uh, video evaluation. She recruited patients to participate in the study, explained the consent process, helped those that were interested in completing the baseline survey to begin the uh, study. Her ability to relate with the patients and provide support and encouragement was a great benefit not only to the study, but also for the patients and their families at the beginning of their transplant journey. So I'll pass it off now to Terry. And just, uh, just a friendly five minute uh, reminder. Thanks, Terry. Good morning. And thank you very much Bob, for those kind words. Um, I was honored to be a research assistant for the transplant program for this study. I hope to give back something for everything this program has given me and continues to give me. Um, so my role was to initially to mail out introductory letters about the study. Um, I would meet the patients in clinics in Saskatoon and Regina and ask if they'd like to participate in the study. If they were interested, they could do the questionnaire at clinic or at home through a secure link. Um, I really enjoyed meeting, oh yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I noticed that my interaction with the study participants, when I shared my, the fact that I had a kidney transplant, some of the study participants seemed to be more comfortable talking to me and asking questions. Interacting with the staff, as busy as they were, uh, they were just so helpful, both at the dial dialysis centers and at the clinics and went out of their way to help me find patients. Doing the survey, participants were able to do surveys at home, which they appreciated sometimes after spending a long day at dialysis or at the clinic. The younger tech savvy patients were able to go through the survey at lightning speed while the non-tech savvy patients like myself needed more assistance. The videos, the participants that were in the group that viewed the videos were impressed with the animation and found the information very easily absorbed. Technology, well, um, sometimes we had iPad connection issues which caused delays, but they could often be fixed on the go with the help from Nicola and Holly. Language and medical terminology. English was not always the participants' first language and they required help doing the study. There were a few incidents where participants had issues understanding medical terminology. One young man asked me what impotence was. The patient lists were not always accurate, but the staff was always quick to let me know of any changes. Thank you very much. So just to wrap up here, we have completed our video um, series for kidney transplant patients, and then some lung patients who volunteered with the Lung Association, now called Lung Sask in Saskatchewan, reached out to us about doing something for lung patients as well. And so with the help of Lung Saskatchewan, 
this project took on a new life of its own and involved new patient partnerships and a new needs assessment and new consultations with patients and caregivers. And so once again, we had various patients involved in various capacities right through from conception to evaluation. And we've also received funding. We're happy to report to continue the work in the pediatric space. And we're working with a mother of a kidney transplant recipient to help us get this project underway. And then just to finish up, they say it takes a village and <laughs> this has definitely been our experience with this project. And it's been our greatest pleasure to work with so many patients and so many stakeholders. And if anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to take them. All right, thank you very much, uh, Holly, Nicola, Prague, and, and Terry. And uh, I don't see any hands up or any comments right now. I guess there's one one question here. Is uh, it it looked like uh, some of the involvement of the patients was was I think the word that uh, Prague used was uh, sort of serendipitous. Uh, and then, uh, but then in other ways, it was you looking for patient participants in the in the process. Are there ways that you can think of that that people that may be interested in getting involved, how they would do that? How, because I remember in my, my case, I was in Toronto General after my transplant, and they showed me a video. It was actually, I think, about nine years out of date by the time I saw it. And, and, so, and I was thinking, wow, I, I could help clean some of that up. So how do you get from there to helping support you know, your, your program? Education is so essential. So do you have any ideas on that, how patients can do that or, or others, caregivers? Yeah, I think one of the things is really to let your team know. So most programs, well, all programs are involved in education and, and research as well. And so I think, you know, a lot of it was serendipitous, like Prague reached out to me at the right time. Terry reached out. It, it just seems like when something's meant to happen, it just all falls into place. But the biggest thing is definitely like let your team know that you're interested and also let them know what skills you might have. It'll be so, so um, your team will be so happy to hear that. Thank you. I, I see there's a question. Sean, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah. Hi, Holly and Nicholas. Great to see you both again. <laughs> We've had the opportunity to work together in the last uh, year on, on uh, projects also requiring patient uh, education. But um, I think as some of us who are uh, policymakers or clinicians planning new programs, um, what kind of time commitment and cost um, would you say it would take to properly do what you've just done? Um, for other initiatives, as you know, we're uh, you guys are are looking at another one for for us yeah. uh, on the project we completed. But um, I, I think education sometimes gets the uh, the end. It's kind of like uh, doing the uh, the evaluation. It kind of waits till the end, and sometimes isn't done as, nearly as well. You've done amazing work here, but you know how much uh, time commitment and, and financial support should people budget for when they are trying to implement something for patients. Do you want me to start with this one? Or sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say it can't be an afterthought. It has to be no. treated as its own project and you have to involve the right people to do it correctly, of course. I mean, a lot of times it is an afterthought because you're just trying to finish up. And so I think the right consultations, the right um, people, you know, the right kinds of maybe studies that go into that work and then the right kind of evaluation, I, it's a whole, whole thing. <laughs> um, so that didn't answer your cost question. I think it well, depends on what exactly you're looking for, <laughs> how and, long it might and be. Probably, yeah. And probably who you have involved, I guess, because I think from our perspective, our costs were, I mean, Holly's got a better sense of, of, of what the videos cost. We paid for um, very little of what you see. I think we paid for the tip of the iceberg. Um, yeah. A lot of the work that was done, you know, that Holly and I did, we we did as essentially volunteer time, a, as well as, you know, a couple of our colleagues here at the program. Um, so, you know, in those kind of situations, obviously you can keep costs down and hopefully quality up, you know, if you're able mm -hmm. to recruit good people who are interested in providing of their time. But just, you know, uh, for us, I guess that that first set took us a really long time, mostly because we didn't know what we were doing. Right. So yeah. I think, uh, you know, when it came right down to writing script, for example, you know, after we'd done all these and consultations and evaluations, I think we spent about 200 hours writing script um, you know, for the healthcare providers to say, right, and sort of get that um, um, 
really, I, I suppose not the healthcare providers, but the animations, you know, to be read over right. to explain, you know, uh, concepts that were occurring on the screen. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know how long it took us, Holly. Years. <laughs> Years, but I think every time gets better because you learn what works yeah. and what doesn't. And so yeah. we yeah. could give a whole presentation on what not to do. That, yeah. <laughs> that would be oh, yeah. a good presentation. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but I think that is part of the exercise is also learning from the experience and, and helping to identify what would we do differently next time and you know yeah. how can how can we better integrate it into projects going forward as you know like ours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like ours exactly. <laughs> All right, I see one more hand up last uh, question. Oh last one to Sylvain again. Yeah. All right, uh, Sylvain. Going back to Sean, uh, I know there's a cost for that, but how much the benefit are savings? So the savings of doing it, knowing that probably lots of patients now are more in it. So I suggest an economist in there. Yes, the cost, but how much thousands or hundreds of dollars, uh, thousands of dollars you've probably saved in lives you've cost. Uh, uh, I know that Mary Wilson would, uh, is there. You would certainly prove that there's no enough. Uh, the cost is way lower than the, the benefit. You know, you know what I mean? There we go. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, again, uh, thank you, uh, Holly, Nicola, Prague, and Terry. And